Welcome to the On Purpose Investor Podcast show number 50. Let's make an offer. There is value to being able to make a quick offer mm -hmm. and then get into the nitty gritty. Yeah. And if there's something majorly wrong with the house, you can ask for a price reduction, but you don't want to make that your policy. Yeah. Welcome to the On Purpose Investor Podcast with your host, Eric and Tiffany Vogel. We've spent several hard years building a rental property portfolio so we can have more time with our family and live our ideal life. Now, finding your path can be difficult, so we're here to guide you along the way with lessons, tips, and tricks to design and implement your dream life. Now, sit back, turn up the volume, smash that follow button, and get ready for this episode of The On Purpose Investor. What's going on, On Purpose Investor Nation, and welcome back to our podcast. Today, we are continuing our discussion, talking about all the things you need to know before investing in real estate and to get you on your way to building your dream life. The first two episodes we just went through in this season were your buy box and running the numbers. Running the numbers. And today, we're going to be talking about making an offer, all the little things you need to know before making that offer, and what are you going to do after you've made the offer? So I'm your host, Eric, with my beautiful, lovely, amazing co-host, Tiffany. Yay. <laughs> Welcome back. So last week, we talked a lot about running the numbers before you make your offer. And today, it's we're taking one step closer to owning a piece of property, to owning a piece of rental property, or an investment property, whatever it may be. And that is making the offer. And there are several things we're going to talk about today. But the first thing is looking at the house. Uh, last week, we talked about running the numbers, basically doing your walkthrough and getting an idea. Is it an A, B, C, or D classification? Mm -hmm. And figuring out what type of renovation is it going to be? Yeah. So last week, we talked about running the numbers. That's kind of your sitting in your basement office for Eric or wherever you work. Mm -hmm. And you're on a spreadsheet or a calculator online, whatever works for you. And you're just punching in numbers. That's it. This is the next step. So like you've done the prelim, you say, oh, okay, this could be a deal. I know there's some factors I need to like firm up the Reno budget yeah. and the cost and all these things, but back of the napkin, these numbers work. So That's now right. let's go look at it. Yep. So when we talked last week about running the numbers, the ABCD classification, yes. how much are you going to spend? Um, I talk in this episode about looking at the house. What are we looking for? So we're going to open every single door when you walk into that property. Don't leave a single door unopened. There could be a staircase to a basement or an attic you didn't know about. There could be a water heater that has exploded inside of a closet. There could be a vast array of things that could be hiding behind a closed door. If there are, is a lock on a door, you need to make sure that listing agent or that homeowner, if you're doing an off-market deal, is able to open that door. You don't want to leave a single door unopened. Now, will you make an offer on a house if there's a locked door? Or are you saying before you close on it? I would say door? before you get out of due diligence. Okay. That's make sure you can open that door. Yeah. Don't well, get locked into that deal unless you know what's behind that door. Yeah. Because you never know. There could be a closet full of asbestos stored things. That'd be the craziest thing to be right. stored in a closet. But there but could be a moldy closet. It could or be an absolute a roof mold. leak or yeah. who knows. Yeah. I also would say pay attention to the flooring. Yeah. So the last house that we went and looked at and have under contract now, I did the walkthrough by myself initially. And I noticed where the water heater is. It's a brand new water heater. And there's a different kind of flooring yeah. than the rest of the house. So I looked at our agent and... I said, that's, you know, that's different flooring. And we started stepping on the floor around it. And it's like, oh, it's spongy and squishy. There was a leak at some point. Right. And it damaged the floors. And that's why they put a new water heater, but they didn't fix the floors. And when she told me that, I was like, okay, we have areas of the home that are going to need subfloor. Right. That automatically takes it from A to B. Right. Even if everything else is pristine and everything else is just lipstick, that immediately takes it from A to B. Right. Because what that might uncover is now that there are floor joist issues. Yeah. It might uncover that there's a mold issue. So that would take it to a C or D. If that uncovers into that. Yeah. Now, do, during your due diligence, that spongy floor should lead you to crawl under the house, which I am going to talk about. Yeah. Um, we'll getting get under the house and going to that area. And if it's on a slab, you shouldn't have spongy floors. If you have spongy floors in a slab, run. Run. <laughs> yeah. Or 
take it from a, a B to C yeah. because you know you're going to have to <laughs> repour concrete. Yeah. But get under that house and find where it's spongy and figure out, is okay, it is, it, is it just the floor? Is it just the subfloor? Are the joists cracked? Something like that. We bought a house three or four years ago where the entire house did this giant sloping motion and we had to rebuild the whole floor system because just the center beam was not able to support the whole load of the house. We yeah. had to rebuild everything down there. Yeah. So open every door, step on every surface. Right. Especially around water mm -hmm. with the surfaces. Yeah. Like step behind the toilet. Uh-huh. Uh, Look make sure... under the sinks, yep. laundry rooms, check. Mm -hmm. Everywhere there's a water source, double check it. You're going to double check. Uh, next is going to be, you're going to turn on every single light and you're going to make sure water is running not just out of the pipe, but down the drain. You're going to make sure every toilet flushes and it flushes correctly. There's just so many things that could go wrong. And when I say flush the toilet, don't just flush it once. You're going to flush every toilet at least five or six times. You're going to run the sinks the entire time that you're walking through the house to make sure that it is draining. I'm learning so much. Yeah. You're going to want to make sure that the drainage is working. So after you've done that walkthrough and you've done all that walkthrough, that's when you go under the house okay, to make sure you're ask. not, because it would have enough time to leak and build up. Yeah. So you're looking yeah. for puddles in the crawl space. That's right. It's on a crawl mm -hmm. to see, oh, okay. There's a bunch of water right here. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. So that's, that's when you're so in, initially looking at that house. Now let's dive into building Reno costs. Last week, we kind of spoke briefly on the ABCD properties uh, Tiffany cut me off. She's like, no, that's next week's episode. So mm -hmm. I had to stop, but now we get to dive into it. So the first thing you're going to want to do when you're walking through this house and building your Reno costs is take tons of notes and take tons of pictures. This is every last thing you can think of the kitchen knobs, the hinges, cause you're going to be taking account. If you're replacing that, you're taking a picture of every door front and back. You're taking a picture of the electrical panel of the breakers as well under the sinks and anything else you can think to take a picture of. Yeah. I mean, I know this deal we just did, there were probably 15 pictures online, which is a normal. It was amount. actually a pretty good, but good listing for this. I level took a house. couple extra pictures of things that I noticed and we were still sitting here like, ah, oh, I wish we had more stuff. Yeah. At that point you went and looked at it and got more insight. But yeah, even if you think you're taking a ton of pictures, take even more. Yeah, that's right. So what are you going to do with all these notes and all these pictures? The next step you're going to do is you're going to go build a shopping cart. You're going to literally go on Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, whatever, you know, hardware store or big box, uh, you know, fix up your house store yeah. there is. You're going to build an online shopping cart. Now, you should have while you were doing this, you know, walk through in your due diligence, taken measurements of the windows, taken measurements of the doors, taken measurements of the floor so you can get uh, the correct quote on on the flooring and all of that. And you're going to build an actual shopping cart. Now, when you build the shopping cart, you're going to get to the end. It's going to give you a subtotal. Put that subtotal and the entire cart, I would say, into an Excel chart. Now you're going to take and apply 15% on top of whatever that number is, right? If it's a $10,000 at, right? at a minimum, if it's a $10,000 shopping cart, you're going to have $1,500. You know, that's, that's just what you're going to yeah. do. I know when we first started, we didn't do that. And after a couple of deals, you would give me a cart number and I would just be like, yeah, we're going to round that up an extra five, 10 grand. You would usually go five grand over. Yeah. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, there are going to be unknowns and those unknowns add up so quick mm -hmm. because when you go to add a bathroom, you're, you're probably thinking, okay, we got a toilet, we got a sink, we got a shower. And that's the three things you add to your shopping cart. But what you're missing is all the drywall that's going to go into fixing it. Flooring. All of the flooring that's going to go into fixing it. All of the plumbing, not just the hard plumbing, but all the fixtures as well. When you go buy a, or a sink faucet, you also have to make sure it has a drain. And with that drain, you also have to make sure there's an S-trap. And when you put in plumbing, you also have to make sure that there are valves. There are so many little things that you may not be thinking of. Yeah. And so when I go build my shopping cart, I don't actually put in every last little piece of plumbing. I say, okay, there's a bathroom. I know that there's going to be about $500 in random plumbing parts for that bathroom. So what if you don't know what all it entails? Like, is, does it make sense to have a contractor or what it would, would you absolutely, recommend? I would recommend that you get a contractor out to that house while you're in due diligence. So you're going to have to be prepared. When you make that offer, make sure you have someone that you've already called and said, hey, I'm making an offer on a house. If I get the offer... Can you meet me within these three to five days to walk it with me? 
or hire an inspector. Or hire and a lot of inspectors are also handymen. I would not use the yeah. same inspector to do the work. Right. But they should be able to give you a report that you could take to a contractor. Right. So all of this you're saying is before you make the offer. This right? is um so with when going nitty gritty into building this reno cost, that I would say is in your due diligence. Okay. That's so your, you've made that's, an offer. That's you've made the offer and you're under contract. This is where you are in due diligence. Okay. When you're like just getting started. You're going to do you that know... first section of looking at the house. You're going right. to open every door. You're going to look under every cabinet. You're going to step on every and piece you know of flooring. You want to add a bathroom. Let's yeah. say, call a handyman and say, hey, I want to add a bathroom. Here's roughly what it looks like. How much ballpark? You know, and most bathroom additions, depending on your area, are going to be low end of $5,000 upwards of $50,000. Yeah. Well, in any example, on the level. like, you know, I'm going to, it's a 2000 square foot house and I need to replace the floors. Call a flooring company and say, I want mid-grade carpet throughout the house or I want, I don't know, whatever flooring you plan to put in. Yeah. They can give you a ballpark quote yeah. that will get you at least in a roundabout area. Then you tack on that extra 10 to 20%, mm -hmm. whatever you feel comfortable with. Right. And that gets you enough to be able to make a solid offer. That's right. And so let's say we're in due diligence right now. Yeah. You know, so we've made your offer. We've made our offer. We've submitted it. We're under. We're in due diligence, and you're building the shopping cart, and you're you're trying to make sure your numbers still work in due diligence. You got to now add in labor. Um, so you've built your materials list. Now you got to add in labor. Uh, what I my general rule of thumb is you're going to add two hundred percent of your material list in labor. So if you have a ten thousand dollar material list, you're going to have twenty thousand dollars in labor. So you have a $30,000 renovation budget. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you're going to double it, basically. You're going to double it. Now, um, some contractors are going to be in the 100 to 150% of your materials cost, but I would budget for 200%. I would be scared. Contractors sometimes means cheap work. Yeah, that's and true. you get what you pay for. That's right. We have learned that. I would always budget for 200%. The one that we just did that we're under contract yeah. right with right now was 175%. Okay. So that was, you know, very good place to be yeah. and i know that they'll do a great job and you know this contractor is trying to build a long-term relationship that's so right. that's probably why you got it lower and, than two. and there's a lot of strange little work that needs to happen yeah that's why it was so high yeah all right so now is at a point of your due diligence and building your numbers that you can go look at the materials and the labor and decide do you want to do any of that work yourself right because I know on the front end of running your numbers, you do not want to force the numbers to work. But this is a place where you can make a decision on the whole house needs to be painted. And I know I got a quote for $12,000 to paint this house. But my wife and I or my partner and I, we or just me, I have a lot of free time from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. every day. And I'm not doing anything. You can go paint that house for $600. You can go and paint it. It might take you three, four weeks, but you, you got to make sure yeah. that that aligns right. That's with your numbers as well, with the holding costs. I, a lot of times we did the work ourselves when we got started because we didn't have the cash yeah. to put in, but that extended the time that it took to renovate it. So you've got those holding costs, but you also, if you're keeping it as a rental, that's two, three months without rent coming in. Yeah. So you'll have to take all of those factors into well, consideration. And just, if your rent is 1500 a month, and you, it takes you an extra month, that's $1,500 in cost that you spent, but, plus the holding costs. Yeah, but let's say that you know their holding costs for a month was $2,000, and the lost rent was $1,500, so they're $3,500 right. negative by doing it themselves, right. but they saved $9,000 right. for doing it themselves. Agreed. So taking that into consideration, is it worth doing it yourself that's where this they can make that decision yeah. i'm going to do this myself and save net i'm going to net save right. five thousand just make sure you keep in mind doing it yourself generally takes longer it does you pay a paint crew they're what two days to get a job done for a big job we have a 3500 square foot house and it took them four days okay that's it so would have taken me probably six weeks right i mean just being honest because yeah. i'll get tired of it and go do something else right or you get like me and accidentally get high off of paint and then yeah that that's fun. the thing <laughs> things you need to learn don't uh paint in low ventilated areas <laughs> yeah. and then you're gonna take all those numbers oh my god <laughs> it happened i was not in purpose it was an accidental high yeah we so don't endorse this yes 
It was accident. But know, know that there are hidden costs, if yeah. you will, to doing stuff yourself. Absolutely. Or to paying a cheap contractor that takes longer to get the work done. That's true. It's it's very true. And then you're going to take all these numbers and going to use them to to run your numbers of maybe you did all of this before you made an offer. And if you're able to do this really quickly, it might make sense to do that because you could be really honed in on your price. Yeah. But if, if it's in a fast paced market and you need that offer to go in one, two, three hours after it got listed, you're not going to have time to do all that. Yeah. So it really depends on your market, how fast are houses moving and the price of that home. Because in any market, if the house is priced right, it's yeah. going to go quick. Well, and I think there is value to being able to make a quick offer mm -hmm. and then get into the nitty gritty. Yeah. And if there's something majorly wrong with the house, you can ask for a price reduction, but you don't want to make that your policy. Yeah. Because then if, with MLS deals, you know, the agents are going to know, oh, they, yeah, they say they're going to pay this, but they always come back and ask for 20 grand off. Yep. Remember, you're always building a relationship. Yeah. No, no matter if it's positive or negative, you're yep. building a relationship. So I have two different trains of thought here on, you know, making your offer. Um, let's make an offer, right? The, the two sides are, is it MLS listed? Uh, and that's the multiple listing source. That's houses that you see on Zillow, Redfin, or if you're an agent, you see them on MLS. So on market. On market. And then we have everything off market. This is from a mailer campaign. This is from door knocking. This is from your cold website. calling, your website generating yeah. leads. So on the two sides, there's, there's a little bit different structuring on how you can make these offers. Yeah. So let's go with on market first. Yeah. What's the first thing you do when you're trying to build that strong offer on um, an on market yeah. deal? You make an offer on what works yeah. based off of your numbers. Mm -hmm. And if it's insulting, it's insulting. You obviously you're not just intentionally trying to be, you know, lowballing, but yeah. you, you you do what works. Right. And don't make the numbers fit to make a deal happen right. either. Right. But I mean, with an on-market deal, it's already listed at a certain price point. So you have an anchoring point. And if you know the numbers that work is 50% of what it's listed for, I might not make that offer. Yeah. I, or you might talk to your agent. Yes. Make sure you have an excellent, awesome agent that you can work with that you trust that is going to represent you well. And you ask your agent, hey, this is the number that it works at. Right. Do you mind just giving them a text or a call and asking them if they would even consider this? Yeah. And that's called a verbal offer. And in multiple states, those verbal offers are legal and bound. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the state that you're in. But have your agent reach out to the listing agent and say, hey, uh, this is a two hundred thousand dollar house, but my client can only offer a hundred. Would your seller even consider it? Right, and they're likely going to say no. That their bottom dollar is like well above that. Yeah, and at that point, we trust that our agent had that conversation. We trust that our agent is going to come to us with real, truthful information, and he's going to tell us, "Hey, they're nowhere near that number." Yeah, and we're going to say we can't force our numbers. Usually, he has a good idea of where they're at, though. Yeah, he does a lot of pre leg work. Yeah. Uh, reaching out and saying, hey, my clients are investors and they usually offer, you know, 70 to 80 percent of of ARV. Um, this is what I see the ARV as. This is probably what their offer is going to be. You know, are y'all anywhere in that ballpark? Yeah. And then he's going to come to us when we go look at the house and he's going to say, hey, you know, I know where y'all are. I know what this house looks like. We've done right. enough deals with him that he knows our renovation level. Yep. And he'll say, Y'all, um, happy to be here and looking at the house with you, but I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> Usually it's, hey, good to see you and the kids, but I don't know. Like Sometimes he'll just call us before we even go yeah. look at it and say, guys, this is, yeah. it's, I've talked to the agent, the listing agent, it's not going to work. Right. I have gotten to where if I find the deal online by just searching Zillow or however, you know, it comes across, I reach out to him. He looks at it mm -hmm. and he'll do a quick, like, you know, is it in the right range price wise for what the pictures and the listing description and yeah. private remarks says? And then from there, we go to the property and I kind of let him steer what we offer a yeah. lot of times, because to me, a two thousand dollar to ten thousand dollars is if that makes or breaks the deal, then we don't need to do that deal. We can find ways to make it work within the renovation or yeah. I mean, we're buying Within the for financing, and so in five years, three grand over on asking 
isn't going to make a difference on our overall picture on that deal. Right. You don't want to go 20 grand over of what it is worth. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, it does. So I, I ask him like, you know, is this priced right? Yeah. Can we get it down? If we can, cool. But like, if not, I'm willing to pay full asking yeah. or above. I guess I'm saying don't, don't pay too much, but also be willing to pay a fair price. And at the end of the day, in 10 years, if you plan to hold it for 10 years, what you paid for it doesn't matter. Yeah. Are, it's, it's the, are the numbers sound? Right. Is it going to cash flow? That's yes. the biggest question. Right. Does and it do cash you have flow? some equity in it? Yeah. I mean, the house we bought a year ago, mm -hmm. we overpaid for it. I think we paid seven or 8,000 over listing. And... and it was, I mean, it was still a deal. We added a bathroom. So we added some sweat equity in that, but. Yeah. I didn't add the bathroom. We had a contractor at the bathroom, yes, right. but there was sweat equity. It wasn't my sweat, but there was equity built into value it. add. There was a value add. Yeah. But now it doesn't matter because appreciation and not that we count on appreciation. It's just the sprinkles on top as our son who is learning how to talk says, yeah, yeah. he puts like the back end of the word at the front. Yeah. So it's like K L E S S P R I N. That's impressive. It's, it's really weird. It's like close Maybe he's point. dyslexic. It, yeah. All right. It's just like his Uncle Bill Cook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So, you know, that's the front end of working with an on-market deal. Yeah. Now we're ta let's talk about the Hold offer. On. I just want to go back real quick. Okay. So we're not saying overpay for a house. We're saying don't get hung up on $1,000 or $3,000. Or saying that you bought the house for a discount. Or yeah. There's, there's so much power people put in the clout of an offer that right. it's like i just got a great deal yeah did you though like well at, at the I, end of the day know. you want to win-win for you yes. and the seller and if you're planning to flip it does matter that one thousand three thousand whatever it is matters yeah that's true but if you're holding it for the long term and you're getting a 30-year fixed rate loan in 30 years your house is going to be paid off and appreciation is roughly five percent a year for our market so mm -hmm. like a few grand, who who cares? That's a rounding error at that point. That's right. That's right. That's so, so true. I I don't want to be misconstrued and use and saying like just throw out an offer. It doesn't matter. But I'm just saying don't get hung up on a couple thousand dollars. Exactly. If That's, you're doing a long term plan. You gotta have that abundance mindset versus your, you know, scarce mindset. Right. It, it's, it, it just yeah. goes a long way. Um, when you can shift your mindset to think that yeah. way. All right. My soapbox is done. You can continue. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to how strong of an offer can you make to an on, on market deal? Yeah. Um, I feel like there are four main categories into making an extremely strong on market offer. And those four categories are due diligence, contingencies, cash versus finance and earnest money. So let's talk about due diligence days. Yeah. We usually see these as DD days or triple D Right. So often when people go buy a house and they are just a, a residential retail buyer, retail buyer, often you see seven to 14 days of due diligence. So what does that mean? Due diligence is the time where you have to go hire an inspector, get an appraisal if you want to be that extra and get an early appraisal. I mean, I don't know. People might want to do that. I, I think it's a little extra. But you might. You're saying get, an additional, like a BPO a, before a, a BPO before, which is a broker priced opinion. Okay, yeah. So that is so basically. You're saying a, not the official appraisal. You're saying a pre appraisal. I have heard of people getting a full appraisal during due diligence. That's expensive. Yes, it is. Those are five, six hundred dollars. I'm just telling you. Okay, people do sorry, it. People I, do I it. didn't know people did that. Um, so seven to fourteen days. That's where people go in and do their inspections. They have their families come look at it with them. They might get mom and dad to come look at it with them. You know, you have the inspector and then you have your, your dad and that's yeah, the real inspector. Right. right? And so, <laughs> so it's the, whatever time period you agreed to between the offer being accepted and an exit. Yes. So you put up earnest money. Earnest money is the money you pay to lock in that property. Yep. So you might say, okay, I'm going to give you $5,000. It goes towards the purchase price. And the deal is if you walk away from the property without closing, they keep that $5,000 outside of the due diligence. Yeah. Phase. So with the due diligence days, let's say you sign up for a week or, you know, put in your offer a week of due diligence. So you have seven days from the day they accept your offer until 
you have to be locked in. Those basically. are the days that you're dating the house. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so due diligence is essentially a dating period. You're getting to know the house. You're getting to figure out, do you like the way it operates? Uh -huh. I like where this is going. Is there a lot of work that needs to be done to yeah. make this relationship work? Is the person crazy or not? Is the person crazy or not? Are you willing to accept that crazy? Stuff yeah. like that. Is the family crazy? I accepted the crazy, y'all. Yeah. Whoa. Is the family crazy? <laughs> That's the real question. Is the question. family crazy? Are the neighbors crazy? Yeah. You know, it's, it's just you're dating the house during yeah. due diligence. And Once then... due diligence ends... You just got engaged. You right. spent a lot of money on an engagement ring. That's your earnest money. Yeah. Right. And then when you get to closing, closing is you get married. So if you get engaged, you're out of your due diligence period mm -hmm. and you say, oh man, I just found some crazy. I don't want to, I don't want to be with this person. Just found some, you're going to break up that engagement, but, but you lose. Yeah. They keep the ring. You lost your due diligence money. So your earnest money is the ring. Yeah. You're giving it to that seller as a promise mm -hmm. that you are going to marry by the house. Yep. And if you don't withhold that promise, they keep the ring. They yep. keep the earnest money. That's it. That's a good analogy. Hey, it's all up here. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors up there, but mostly and uh, uh, there's cobwebs. Yeah. Too, but <laughs> and if they don't withhold, you if have they don't hold up to their end of the bargain. Yeah. There's you... if I guess there's contingencies in the deal also that can get you out. So after you've gotten engaged. So, so far we've talked due diligence and earnest in a strong on market deal and in, in an on market deal, a strong offer with those two considered is low due diligence days, mm -hmm. higher earnest money. Right. So we make offers with 5,000 to $10,000 in earnest money with three days of due diligence. Yeah. So we have three days to date the house yep. and decide, are we willing to potentially lose that money? Yeah. Or are we locked in? That's it. The other two areas she spoke a little bit about it, contingencies and cash versus finance. So contingencies can range from whatever you can think yeah, of. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times in Georgia, it's pest treatment on the house. Does like it a have termite a, bond. a clear termite letter? Um, septic tanks a lot of times will can say it, it has it, to be pumped. Or can it get a clear septic letter? Yes. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of contingencies, though. Let's say you're buying a house that has solar energy on it you could write a contingency to say if the solar doesn't work i get to back out yeah and it might take three or four weeks to get a solar company right. out there to check that well you just bought an extra three to four weeks of due diligence essentially because you can get out if it shows right. that that doesn't work yeah but when you're trying to write a really strong on market offer you're going to only put in the contingencies that you're willing to accept right. the risk on. There's also appraisal contingencies. So mm -hmm. like if the house doesn't appraise, I'm only willing to put up $10,000 above appraisal yep. because the bank won't loan above that. You have to come up with that cash. Right. There's a lot. It's really anything you can dream up. In a strong on-market offer, list as few or no contingencies as yeah. possible. Yeah, I also want to add, you don't have this on your list, but uh, the time to close is also yep. important. Yeah. How quickly can you close? Typically on a retail buy, it's 30 to 60 days. It used to be 60 when we first started buying. It was, it was always 60. It was always 60. And then the market got crazy and, and then it became 30. I got a feeling closing days are going back to 60, 90. Yeah. They're going back to that two to three months is how long it takes to close yeah. a house which is great for us investors because we can generally close a lot faster with our financing. And right. The house that we're under contract now, we made the offer last Friday and we're closing next Monday. Yeah. I mean, it was a two week close. So it was, I think we did 5,000 in due diligence or two, in earnest money. 2,000 in earnest. Okay. It's a lower priced house. So yeah. that's what drove the earnest. Um, but it was three days due diligence. Yeah. So two at the close. end of the day, if, if we didn't follow through, and this seller had to put the house back on the market. In two weeks, he just made two grand. Right. It's not a bad day. He well, still wants to get rid of the house. Yeah. And we just created a, a reputation of not following through. So we follow yeah. through. And right. that's what we are. Yeah. That's what we hold ourselves to. Right. That we keep our word. If we say we're going to buy it, we're going to buy it. Yeah. I don't think we have lost our earnest money on any deals. Um that very first one. I don't think we lost we, our earnest. Did we get it back? We did because they were not performing. The okay. house had probate issues. So it took six, nine months or something before we it finally was, walked away. It was pretty but, bad. So we've talked due diligence days, time to close, contingencies, earnest money.
So you just have financing. Yeah. So it, are you going to buy this with cash or are you going to finance this? Mm -hmm. A really strong offer is going to be an all cash offer. And usually you're going to have to have a proof of funds right. to show that you have cash available, whether it's a screenshot of your savings account. We've sold a few flips to where that was their proof of funds. Yeah. They're like, I just sold a house and I have $400,000 in my savings. Hey, there's a screenshot. Good there's the, you. there's the proof of funds. Like, uh, when awesome. we sold that house in uh, Northwest, they had a savings account. They had that much money. In right. Because they sold I think a house. they had like a 30% of the value loan. Yeah. And normally it's the other way. It's 70%. Yeah. Yeah, so. It was it was a unique situation, but you're going to have to have that proof of funds yeah. with, with a cash purchase. Right. And with a finance purchase, you're going to have to have a mortgage company giving you an amount you can finance. Right. Um, that's essentially a proof of funds, yeah. but it's called something different. I don't know what it's called, but yeah. it's like a finance. It's like a pre-approval letter yes. of how much qualification. Yeah. If you want a competitive offer, do a cash offer. And we do cash offers with our private money lenders or hard money lenders. But uh, we'll talk about lenders on a future episode. But you want to have the ability to close quickly and with financing that doesn't require a lot of hoops to jump through. That's right. If you do conventional financing, you're going to have a lot of... And there's a possibility with a financed offer that they get the inspection report and they're going to require a lot to be fixed yeah. before they're willing to even loan on it. Right. I mean, VA, like... The requirements on a VA loan. They're very high. They're very high. Because and they're protecting the veteran buying the home. Right. And they want to make sure that they're securing that home. Right. They're insuring it. FHA, VA, uh, USDA all insure yeah. that property. Mm -hmm. So they want to make sure it's in good repair. That's so right. that's there's a lot to that. Real estate agents can help point you in the right direction if you have or a mortgage lender, if you have questions on financing. But just know a Solid offer would be few due diligence days as you can, as you say, feel comfortable. I with. would say three to five days due diligence, but do what you're comfortable with. Yep. If you think you need a full inspection, I would give yourself closer to five to seven days. We, we do our own inspections and we know when we're making an offer that we in, intend to move on, we make sure that it's in the timeline that Eric can get out there and look at it. That's right. You know, so if we're talking about just an absolute solid offer, Taking out the amount, taking the just take out the price. Uh, we're just talking about everything that goes into the offer. I would say three to five days due diligence, mm -hmm. whatever you're comfortable with. But I would say three to five contingencies, as few minimal, as if not none. Yeah. Um, but if you think it's an old septic tank or something like that, you might throw that in there. I would build that into my numbers That's and fair. expect that you're going to replace it. Yeah. And go in, in the long run. go in with no contingencies yeah. and expect that you're replacing yeah, it. Fair enough. That's what I say. Okay. Um, and if your contingency on, you know, let's say solar and that works, expect that you're repairing or replacing. Yeah. I'd say no contingencies if you can. Yeah. Um, three is an all cash offer. Four would be a lot of earnest money. Whatever yep. fits the bill, I would follow your realtor's advice mm -hmm. on that. And then five, a quick close. Yeah. But make sure you can close it. Yeah. And don't just put offers out there willy nilly and not close them. Yeah. You want to make sure it's something well, that you can actually live up to. There's a lot of folks out there and I'm going to explain it and then tell you what we call them. And you're probably going to understand it as soon as I start talking about it that make awesome, awesome, strong cash offers on homes and they never close them. They sell the contract. They assign the contract. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, these are called wholesalers. Now, wholesalers have a great job of bringing good projects to investors that don't want to take the time to hunt a deal or that they just found it before the investor did. Right. Or sometimes wholesalers are investors who have more deals than they know what to do with. That's right. And usually those come from off market deals, but there are absolutely times where a wholesaler will find it online and they'll make a really strong offer and be able to get it under contract for really low and already have a buyer's list of people that have told them I'm looking for a house in this area for this right. price that is shaped and looks like this. You know, th those I would call them matchmakers in the real estate investing space. If you want to continue down this marrying a house, dating a house, I'd yeah. say wholesalers are the matchmaker. Right. And sometimes they're not great matchmakers, yeah. but sometimes they really are. Just if you're going to put a house under contract, this is where you're going with the wholesaler yeah, tangent. That's right. Make sure you intend to close or have someone who can close it. That's right. That's Don't right. just lock stuff up under contract for 30 days. I mean, we've seen it with 
friends outside of the industry. That's right. Where a wholesaler comes in and says, oh, I need, I can close in two weeks. And then they just, you know, oh, I need another week. I need another week. And the next thing you know, we saw it for what it was and helped him move out of that situation. But they can lock yeah. up a house and you don't want to, you just don't want to be a bad person. Yeah. At be, the end of the day. Yeah. I, when I was a band director, I used to preach this to my kids all the time. Just be good people yeah. and do good things. Right. You know your intent. Yeah. You know what your heart is. Do yeah. the right thing. That's right. Let's move over to yeah. off-market deals. Which I and... guess kind of goes in with what we were just talking about. You know, be honest. Yep. You're not a salesman. You're trying to solve problems at the end of the day. Yeah. And one of the best strategies that comes from one of the best creative uh, finance. Uncle Bill Cook. Uncle Bill Cook. If you don't know who Bill Cook is, he's an excellent teacher. And him and his wife, Kim, do a great job of teaching creative deal structuring. Mm -hmm. And one of the best tools that I have learned from him is creating a T-bar. So let's say you find an off-market deal through one of the various forms of finding it and you get into their house and you're sitting at the kitchen table. And the best thing you can do is to sit down and draw a T-bar where you're going to draw on a sheet of paper across, right? And on top, it's, well, it's going to look more like a T, but the you're on top, you're going to have the, where am I? Your current position. And then where do they want to be? Future right. position. So you ask, why would you sell a nice house like this? And that's from Pete. Pete Fortunato, yeah. Peter Fortunato, um, another yeah. amazing creative real estate so investor. You come to me, you're wanting to buy my house. Yeah. I say, Hey, Tiffany, um, I, I love your home. Why would you want to sell such a nice house like this? Well, I can't keep up with the payments. All right. So that goes on the, where am I currently? Yeah. Future position may be, I don't want payments, right? Or I want to be in a different house. Or you figure out what solves that problem right. for them. You figure out what you're going to put on that right, right hand side. And on the left hand side, I might ask, what do you like about this house? Because that's I like gonna, the location. That's going to help me to identify how can I help them. Right. Because I might have another house. I like the location, but it's too big for what I need right there now. There we go. She, she needs to downsize. So I'm going to put on the right hand side, same location, smaller house. Right. And smaller payments. Smaller payments. So you build this T-bar with where are they right now? What What is hurting? Why are they struggling? Why did they call you to come over to buy their house in the first right. place? And then you're going to list all that out. And on the right-hand side, you're going to work together. You're mm -hmm. going to have a conversation of what looks amazing for you. What would work and make you happy and whole? Right. And then you go into the figuring out how can I buy this to make it make sense for me and to help it make sense for right. you. And price is not always the end all be all with That's that it. kind of situation. Sometimes it's, you know, a tired landlord that just wants to be done with the house and they've got a ton of appreciation. I mean, our last house that we sold, we were fine taking a little bit lower on the price because we just emotionally had a newborn and needed yeah. to be done with that house. And, and we did accept an offer about 15 grand below where it should have been. Right. And we were just happy that, you know, it was gone. We had built in so much equity in that house that we were willing to give away some of it yeah. for the ease of letting it go. Right. And it just didn't work out to fit in our portfolio. It was just, yep. it was just a house that didn't fit right. our buy box for investment properties. Right. It was a great house for us. But price but, is not always the most important thing for a seller. That's right. That's right. That's, that's absolutely true. So you're, you're in this person's house and you're making an off market offer. Now, these offers, they don't include due diligence. They don't include, you know, earnest money and all that. It is simply, what can we agree to that works for us? Right. Because there could be a whole podcast season or 10 whole podcast seasons on off-market deal right. strategizing and structuring. Um, but some quick things that you might be able to formulate and build with the seller are, you know, maybe they keep the mortgage in their name. You take over the payments. You have another house that fits for them. They move into that one. You let them rent it from you. Yeah. Or you sell it to them. You want to carry it to yeah. them. They want to carry it to you. you. There's so many ways to get at it. Mm -hmm. Learn from the people, the gray haired men, as Courtney said. Yeah. On your previous episode, Courtney was interviewed yep. and uh, learn the stuff. Don't just go out there and start making offers that you yeah. can't deliver on. And be careful who you choose as a teacher. Yeah. Make sure it's all above board. Yeah. Our perspective is we like the, the old gray haired men because they've been through the recessions. They've seen a lot and we sure. have mentors who see some of the younger gurus which i know we're sitting here younger but i'm not a guru i know you're not a guru you are yeah. a gray hair man though so oh you're not nice yeah <laughs> <laughs> but they they've been through cycles one of our mentors sent out a newsletter and said hey take this strategy and tweak it to do this and that keeps it above board yeah so just i guess just be careful with who you follow yeah 
Yeah, right. I think the biggest difference between the two is like the difference between shopping at Target and shopping at the flea market. When you're at the flea market, people are selling things that they either don't want it anymore or it's something that they've made and you can talk to them and you can either give them cash and buy the product or you can trade them. You can arrange a so way you're to saying pay for an it. Off market deal. Off market is like shopping at the flea market. Okay. You get to you meet that seller. And... You're going to meet that seller. You're going to go face to face with that seller and you're going to figure out what works for both right. of you. And most of the time it's a, it's a cash transaction, but it doesn't always have to be. Yeah. And the other side of it, the on market deals is more like shopping at Target. Okay. You don't really know that seller. You know that Target being the broker right. is selling like that product. Like you buy uh, the Magnolia products, Joanna Gaines stuff. Mm -hmm. You're not buying from Joanna Gaines. You're buying from this intermediary Target. So the real, I mean, yes, you are buying the house from the seller, but you have these intermediaries brokering and dictating the price, yeah. or not the price. I don't know. My yeah. analogy is not as good as yours have been. No, it's, it's okay. The idea is the agents are the ones communicating. Yeah. And targets the middleman between us and Joanna Gaines. And at the end of the day, there is a just a, there's a wall up, right? Where you don't actually get to meet the seller to figure out what is the absolute right. best solution. So price is the bigger lever that you yep. use on an on market deal. And off market, there are so many other levers right. you can pull. Right. So it really depends on where you are as an investor mm -hmm. and how much time do you have to give and the market you're and in. the market you're in. A lot um, of it. Yeah. We've done off market. We've done on market. We have been successful with both. Right. So just find one that fits for you. But we educated from the people that all they do is off market. Yeah. So. All right. So we've done on market. We've done off market. Let's say and we, we've done our inspection. We've done all that. Yep. We've made a strong offer. Boom. It's accepted. Yeah, you're under now, contract. Now the clock is ticking. Yes. You are engaged to marry this house. Yes. And you've got to ask all the right questions. You got to make sure you are ready to make that formal commitment. Yeah. So, so what do you do? First starting out, get your contractors out there. We we know like our contractors know what kind of flooring, what kind of paint we use. So you just call them and say, hey, I've got X number of square feet. Mm -hmm. But when you're starting out, ask them to come out and measure the house and so really get solid firm up those numbers yeah. like we talked previously about ballpark numbers you really want like legitimate quotes at this point so you know okay the bathroom yeah i thought it was gonna be five grand but my plumber is saying it's gonna be 10 yeah. or it's gonna be four i mean you on the one we're doing right now you put a certain number in for hvac and it's like 70 percent. yeah right. so you you firm up the numbers some will be high some will be low but you get more of a solid, you want a full renovation budget. Yes. And probably a renovation timeline. That's right. So you know, okay, this is going to be a six month project, a three month project. And that way you can get your financing lined up. That's right. And if for some reason you discover something that breaks the bank, it cuts the deal off for you. It doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. You absolutely have the right to tell your agent, hey, I found something that is really bad and it breaks the deal for me. Yeah we need to make an amendment to the contract and I can only offer this now. Or if you're working with that seller one-on-one, -on -one, you say, yeah. Hey, I just, you know, the septic tank has to be replaced. Yeah. I can't make that offer. Like I, I didn't realize that. And with an off market deal, you have the ability to pull a lot of different levers Yeah. of, well, instead of giving you blank amount of dollars as a, you know, takeover, you know, payment right. or, you know, instead of my option costing this much, or instead of me yeah. taking over this amount of the payment, you might have to change have some to, of the levers. You're going to pull some of the levers a little bit, but yeah. on the on market, usually the only lever you can pull is I need to a offer, I need a price reduction. Yeah. And if they or don't ask agree them to fix it or ask them to fix it. Yes. So if they don't agree to the price reduction or, and they don't agree to fix it, they're calling off the engagement. Yeah. They're going to say, well, it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, and you're going to have the opportunity to say, okay, I'm willing to fix this. Right. And do then, my numbers still work? Do my numbers still work? Yeah. Am I going to have to just completely shoot this, you right. know, shoot this horse? So, yeah, it's a pretty bad uh, analogy. Shoot this horse. I don't know what that is. I think something <laughs> fell over over there. <laughs> sounded like, scary. Sounded like there was someone coming in the house. I, know. <laughs> I think we had a trash bag fall over. I think over. it was a ghost. <laughs> All right. So that was terrifying. maximize your due diligence. Yes. You get into the, you get under contract. You got to maximize your due diligence. Right. Be at that house a lot. You know, it is your right within that contract 
to be at that house. Yeah. Now, if it's owner occupied, you're going to have to go through or tenant, um, or tenant occupied. You're going to have to go through the proper channels to make sure you can be at that house, but yeah. be at that house as much as you need yeah. to, to make sure you're making the right decision yeah. as in go on a lot of dates, <laughs> make sure you figure it out. Yeah. All right. Now is the time. If you are using cash or financing to get your money lined up, if, right. if you're doing an on market deal, you got to make sure your money is lined up. So if you have hard money lenders or private money lenders, as soon as you get under contract, even beforehand, you're going to call and yeah. let them know, hey, we made an offer on this house, you know, but I'll let you know if we go under contract. Yeah, I would say you want to give them a heads up to make sure that they have the money before you get under contract. But don't ask any lenders to do a ton of work until you have it under contract. That's right. A lot of things can happen in that due diligence period. Like if you have a mentor helping you analyze deals, run your numbers. Make sure you know enough to run the numbers. And then once it's under contract, send it to your mentor and say, yeah. hey, does this work? Yeah. Because you don't want to to send your mentor 15 deals and waste their time. Yeah. And same with your, your lenders. That's right. So this is the time for you to call up your lender and say, I'm under contract. We close in 14 days. Or if it's finance, we close in 60 days. And find what works for your lender. Yeah. They, our lenders are fine closing in 14 days. Yeah. But if they need 30 days, make sure that aligns with your offer. That's right. On the front end. And the way you can have those, you know, quick cash close offers set up is to build those relationships on the front end. And have several lenders that you work with. Yeah. Because sometimes our main guy doesn't have money because it's all loaned out, which awesome for him. Bad for us. Yeah. So then we go to the next guy. Yeah. And we have probably four or five at this point where... If our two primaries don't work, we know who else we can call. There are people in the wings yeah. that that know that we are, you know, true to our word. We mm -hmm. pay our payments. We we take care of our lenders. Right. And they're they're asking to loan us money. Yeah. And if we need them, we can call them. Right. But all of that started with us hustling and us keeping our word. Yeah. And us building, building up your... strong relationships. Yeah. Pay your lenders back. Do what you say you're going to do. You if pay you, them before you pay you. Well, and every time if it's due on the first, you pay them on the 20th because or before. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 20th before. Yes. Yeah. The month before you pay them early because if something happens and that payment doesn't go through, you like you want time to fix it every time. I know with some of our, our deals, we we had IRA accounts that our private money lenders were using and there was an issue with the payments getting through to them yeah. and we wound up close to being late and I panicked and was like ready to drive him the check. So he got them. Yeah. Just you have to make your payments on time or yeah. early. That's it. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's keeping your word, building up those strong relationships, yeah. never over promise and under deliver. Yeah. You're going to under promise and over deliver. Yes, that, that's, that's, that's what you need to do every time with the seller. Yeah. With your lender. So you with might your say, agent. I need three weeks to close, but you line everything up and you're like, hey, we can close early if you want. Yeah. And that then your realtor looks at the clock. They're like, uh, you went under contract yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> now that didn't happen on this deal we're doing now, but it has happened in right. the past. It's like we, we put in a three week close and in seven days we were ready to close yeah. and we were able to close it early. Right. So, Sometimes we close later because it works better for the seller. Being right. flexible is definitely an asset. That's right. And then, you know, if you find something in due diligence cancel immediately if you need to get out. Yeah. If you have 14 days of due diligence and you find something in day two, don't wait until day 14. Right. Don't, that thing is not magically going to disappear. Right. Like if your numbers don't work to replace that septic tank and they don't agree to fix it and they don't agree to a price reduction, cancel immediately. Yeah. Because what that is doing is it's teaching that your agent, the listing agent, that seller, everyone that listing agent knows, everyone that seller knows, and everyone your agent knows that you are a time waster, mm -hmm. you move slow, and you're not fun to work with. Right. And at the end of it all, you're building relationships and you're building a, a reputation. Right. So sure. your reputation is the biggest thing that can make or break you in this industry. For sure. Because if you're if you're the slumlord, or if you're the, the guy that makes cash offers but never closes, or if you are a jerk, you know, if you're an a-hole, people don't want to work with you. Right. And you build people talk about other people. I mean all the time. Yeah. If you do slimy deals. And your agent's gonna talk to their insurance person, their lender, their attorney. 
it may seem like there's a ton of people out here doing this, but there's not. Yeah. And especially in micro markets, right. They talk. <laughs> yeah. And you will be known as right. something. What you want to be known for is positive. Yeah. Not negative. Yeah. That's all I got. Soapbox done. Soapbox done. Y'all just let's take a short moment to celebrate 50 episodes. That is awesome. All right. Take us out, honey. Thanks y'all for hanging out with us and listening to us talk about the details you should consider when making an offer. What lessons can you take from this podcast and apply to your life? Don't let the time you just invested go to waste. You only get one life, so live it purposely. That's all we have for you today. See you next time. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Head over to onpurposeinvestor.com and sign up for our newsletter to get all the latest updates. If you haven't already, we'd really appreciate an honest review wherever you watch our podcast. All right, now go smash that subscribe and follow button for more tips on building your dream life. See you next week, Pathfinders.